HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 61, recorded Thursday, April 19, 2007. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott discusses with guest Chris Sells the impact of the last 15 years of software. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Carl Franklin has the week off, and I am sitting here in the den computer room of iniquity with uh, Chris Sells. Chris Sells. I just call it my office, but from now on, I will be calling it my computer room of iniquity. So we were chatting earlier about what we would talk about, and uh, we had the idea that we would talk about uh, where is software and Microsoft going to go in the next 15 years, and, and you had a better idea to talk about what we done in the last 15 years as a as a kind of a prequel or a prelude to the first discussion. So 15 years ago was what a, a 92? Yeah, 92. What were we Well, I remember in 92 that's when I took uh Essential Com from Don Box. And after that, I was within a couple of months I was teaching and I remember that being a whole we had just come off the what was the name of that silly architecture where we had the thing in the middle. DNA. Not no. It was even before DNA. There was this. Ooh. This rem- like Tappy was an example of this, where we have the Tappy DLL, and you program your apps against it, and then you had the provider API underneath, and Microsoft provided the thing in the middle, and it was like WOSA or I don't even remember what they called it, but some architecture. Windows, yeah, Windows Unified Software. Something, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And we and now we had just moved from that into Calm. Component based software. And that I remember that being a huge idea. The idea that we had binary components that we could build reusability yeah. into our software and use it across languages. Now that actually had some, I mean, that wasn't just talk. We could, we could almost actually do that. I, I, I remember 92, 93, I was working at a place that did, um, uh, car parts cataloging and people would say, I have a, you know, an 85 Caprice or whatever, and I want to see a fax with all the parts on it. And we had this huge database, many, many megabytes in size. Yes. <laughs> wow. Was, uh, many megabytes. I think it was like SQL 425 or 421 or something sure. like that. Sure, sure. And uh, NT, it was just in beta, NT35. 35, 351. Yeah. That was the era. Yes, yes, and, yes. And when, when component-based software kind of blew me away was then when it came time for us to generate the fax... We automated Word because Word six had come out. Oh, sure, 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 and sure. And we ran this Visual Basic app on the server side that would listen to the fax. You know, we had like a digiboard or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Calls yeah. would come in. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes. We, had, oh, like, we, had, we had a fax farm. Yes, but we had this server with sixteen megabytes of RAM that would automate all these copies of of Word and build from the database. You know, for each car, and we built these giant Word docs and then faxed them. And, wow. And it was Word software as a service, you know, and Word as a I service. I know, I know to this, even to this day, people still try to build websites that generate Excel spreadsheets by automating Excel on the back end, which does not work at all. And in fact, has spawned a whole mini industry within a component industry for just, um, components that generate, uh, Excel compatible files. Yeah. I just make, uh, was it XML spreadsheet format? Yep. But you're right. That, that kind of has become the, the exact wrong thing to do. Yes. That's but the prototypical example. And, but people do it all the time. Yeah. So, and it, so I, I look at the technology by how easy it is, how powerful the technology is, is how easy it is to build the, a bad thing that still works. And so the beauty of component based software is that you could build something that would just a terrible architecture, right? That you could automate Excel on the, on a, on a heavy multi-user system, and it would sort of almost sometimes work. And it was the whole idea of binary components that enabled that. Wouldn't that mean that that, that dot .NET is making it just that much easier to do stupid stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what about the pit of success, right? I mean, Rico Mariani says, allow them to fall into the pit of success. 
make your systems such that even if they screw up, it still turns out okay. Well, so the, and and I guess that's a, that's a much better way to say what I say, right? Which is even if you write something that's not optimal or even approaching optimal, you can still solve your problem well enough to move on, right? There, there are two kinds of computer people, right? There are the computer people like you and I, and probably most of your listeners that are unhealthy about their love of computers, right? That they obsess over writing good code and that, that has a meaning to them, right? Right. The purity for purity's sake. Exactly right. And these are the people that look at an architecture, they look at code and they don't even, they don't even think about it anymore. They just have this Persig style code quality, code. right? They can feel the quality or not. And they keep working on it until I, the quality I, oozes. I can feel the quality so much that I know now it's been 10 years since I've written some decent code. Really? <laughs> you know, like, like, like my sense of code smell is so highly advanced. Code smell, I cannot yes. write any good code at all. I am incapable of writing code. I'll write like four lines and I'll just go, Oh yeah, but oh, what if someone <laughs> used, what if someone used this line of code at 2 a.m. the moment the date, you know, the DST yes, says, yes, yes. Oh, it'll never work yep. in Sri Lanka. <laughs> oh, you know, and then. Well, so there, again, we have. Then I apply my success as a metric thing. Right? Exactly. So, so, um, you know, we are unhealthy in our love of the computer code, right? And then there's most of the programming population, the people that actually have business problems to solve, and they solve them, and they install and deploy and support the systems and move on with their lives. And their business makes money as and a result of that. sleep well at night. Exactly right. And until their pagers go off, of course. Okay, so I slept pretty well 15 years ago. Well. Because we had a system and it worked really well. There you go. And... Right. And you had cobbled together these pieces and it was, it was this binary component object model thing that enabled it. So that binary components, big thing. And of course, the, the binary component kind of in the abstract and the power of that was the, the Clemens Sapersky book, the component book. Do you remember the title of that book? That, well, so the, the reason I bring that up is because Clemens is on my team now at, Ooh, at that the, must be weird. Yeah. For that's, you. that's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. He's a good guy. He's a really yeah. good guy. Yeah. He's fun to work with. You're just kind of go, uh, you, you're Clement, you know, even in the middle. Well, of- except I also work with Chris Anderson, Don Box. Yeah. Yeah. So I, oh, yeah. I could spend there, a lot of time. There is that. Just kind of, Clem- you can Clemens, be all wide eyed. But- Clemens Vasters works around the hall for me. I run into him all the time. I mean, you know, yeah. there's a lot of that. Two Clemens on one floor. Yes. In fact, the only two Clemens in all of Microsoft work in the same corner of the same building. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So binary objects, that was a big deal right. in 92. So what else? What since uh, the graphical stuff? I mean, hey, even your secretary can write an application. You just drag a button onto a form. So I would say the the Alan Cooper style drag and drop UI design that the the what you see is what you get for application developers. That was huge, right? Visual Basic one zero and on MFC um, class wizard. Yeah, the absolutely the the dialogue editor and MFC, and you could go back and forth between that and your yeah, code. Yeah. Um, but I'd say that probably the best example of that is really the, the WinForms designer. I'm, a, I'm in love with that. Really? You think so? I am. I, I'm not a big fan of the... I always got frustrated when I would do something. I'd go and edit the, you're not supposed to edit this part. <laughs> sure. And then I'd get the big kind of like red icon of The death. big red X. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And of course, so what I was going to say is I'm not a big fan of the serialization format they chose, which looks an awful lot like C Sharp or VB, but isn't. Right? Well, yeah. And so... So, you know, as I look forward, I see a better serialization format. XAML. Yeah, XAML. Absolutely. Um, but which makes me feel like we've just come back to 15 years ago. It's just now they're dot XAML files, not dot RC files. Sure. I, I'd say that's true. Although I, th- the, young, the young folks, the young kids today don't know that though. <laughs> the young people. Well, and of course, you know, dot RC files are just the same as HTML files, which are the, the same as However, we define well, screens. Which was the same as a 3270 terminal. 3270, absolutely. Right. The web right. as 3270 exactly. terminal has been an yes. ongoing thing yes. for me. absolutely. That's exactly here we are, right. remoting UI again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly and Now we're going we're all the way back to the, the chubby client again. But the, the reason the I Silverlight. would... Silverlight. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Silverlight is like, well, JavaScript is a lousy computational engine. Let's really be serious in this time, and, and let's, let's enable uh, some managed code uh, on the client, but make it less difficult to get the, the runtime. So Silverlight is definitely a graphics, you know, cross-platform, high-performance, high-fidelity graphics video yeah, platform. Yeah, GDI specific, 2D. But it's still all, um, oh yeah, but 
Well, it's it, still all JavaScript driven on the client. Yes. Well, no, it's JavaScript driven to get the information in and out of it from the DOM, from the HTML DOM into in, into Silverlight and back. But but in May, in March or May of 2006, Mike Harsh, the PM for Silverlight, on his blog said that it will have managed code support. So it's so, become a tiny little so is runtime. that is that the case in the 1.0 version? Uh, that's, that's what everyone's speculating will happen ah, next week at I Mix. See. I see. Uh, you know, I, I can't say either way. We just did it. Our last show was on Silverlight. Sure. So, uh, Paul Wilson of Wilson's.net had basically combed through every interview that Scott Goo ever did. <laughs> right. And like, you know, analyzed the ums and the ahs. And it, everyone believes that there's some kind of managed runtime next week that's happening inside of Silverlight to enable C Sharp in the browser on a Mac. So I have, um, in my WPF book, uh, an appendix written by Sean Wildemuth on w- on Silverlight WPFE. Um, Good guy, uh, I like yeah, Sean. yeah, big Sean fan. I've been trying to get him hired at Microsoft forever. Anyway, well, that's what I do with all my friends. Haven't I tried to get you? You have yes. okay. So um, uh, we have a Silverlight appendix in our book because the uh, it's uh, the the XAML part and the graphics part it's very much a subset of of WP, uh, WPF at that point, right? Um, but there's nothing about managed runtime on the client in that in that, in that appendix. Has yeah. that chapter gone to print? Uh, no, it hasn't. Then you know, I, mm. I have no idea. Well, and we definitely are. Um, All I know we're is keeping that, our eyes open for mix. Yeah, that's what they intended. That's what Mike Harsh. And again, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been printed no, publicly on MSDN blogs. I got, it. I got, it. I got it. So my point being, though, that whether it's JavaScript or whether it's C sharp, it doesn't matter. The point is that. There's all these Pentium 4s out there not doing any freaking work. They're waiting around for angle brackets to show up so they can do something with them. For the most part, my CPU is largely idle. I mean, basically, my CPU does two things. It waits for web pages to show up so it can show them to me, <laughs> and it makes thumbnails. So it's in funny. Explorer. Those are the two things that my CPU does. So it's funny because I... I... Why aren't we using the web as a big... Why aren't, why aren't web applications... More of the kind of distributed computation farm kind of a thing. So I, I so absolutely do. I definitely do surf to websites, right? I do. I mean, I look up movies You're on websites. Here on yes, yes. To yes. Surf I, the web. I surf the web. Okay. Absolutely. All right. You heard it here first. <laughs> I, I search for information on the web, but I'll tell you more and more. I mean, I, I live and breathe the real outlook, right? Not the web outlook. I spend all my time in various. It, Copies of Visual Studio, sometimes two, three at a time. Um, Word, uh, PowerPoint. I'll, I'll probably These are all connected applications. You're saying, though. but they're outside the browser frame. They own their own frame. Not only yes, and they take advantage of the operating system platform so much so, in fact, that I just got I had to order some new memory for my laptop. Well, let me give you an example. Like someone said uh, on an alias recently that uh, they were frustrated that they have to upgrade to the latest version of QuickBooks because the older versions weren't supported on Vista. And another guy said, well, hey, I just used the QuickBooks web version, and oh. it is 92% well, you know, uh, the same. And, and, and every once in a while, you'll be using it, and you'll think that it's the, the real desktop version. And you, oh, oh, wait a second, I'm on the web. It's that good. Wow. But the benefit, you know, the, the 8% that you lose, and these are just kind of nonsense numbers, but the little few percent you lose is outweighed by the fact that his accountant can log in to sure. any machine and manage his... You definitely see benefits in a connected app. So what are the benefits of a connected app versus a a non-connected app? The only difference is then distribution. One you visit with an URL and one you install from an MSI. But even so, even, I mean, today with, well, for a while now with ClickOnce and WinForms and WPF, which you visit with an URL, and now with Silverlight, with the rich stuff inside the browser window, sure, the very sure. rich stuff. It even, you know, before with Flash. But but, the but rich no touch stuff de- in the browser. No touch deploy was largely kind of a point nine release and people got frustrated with it. Right. And click one, once is click, the one oh. Click once works pretty well. I've yep. written a number of them. Yes. Until you get into certificate revocation problems. There's a pretty if you're if you're certificate sure. then you're kind of screwed. Sure. And that's a known bug. Sure. I mean it's it's there and it's closed, but you know, Office as click once app. Yeah, I don't know. You know what I'm saying that'd be pretty yeah. sweet. So my my admission about surfing the web before was mainly about yes, there's a bunch of apps that I use, you know, uh, sixty seconds at a time all day long. Mm. But if I have to spend more than five minutes in an app, I I can't stand a web app. That 
That, really? Yeah, I just I'm such a keyboard guy, ah, and I'm such a Windows short, okay, UI short, guy. Yes, okay. And without that, I I can't use an app. It drives me crazy. It really does. And so that's why I'll use OA only on computers that I occasionally OA use. OA is Outlook Web Access. Thank you. Um, simply because it's there and I can use it for five minutes to check my email quick to see sure, if I'm sure, late sure. for something or whatever. But then I close it down and I go to my real computer. But couldn't you live in Gmail? Actually, Gmail, no. But I'll tell you, um, I probably could live in Yahoo Mail. When I say Control yeah. N in yeah. Yahoo yeah, Mail, it works. It, yeah. it works. So Yahoo Mail was bought. I think they bought Oddpost. They did. Com. They did. They totally did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I just have a little experimental uh, email address over there, and I like that email client a lot more than Gmail. Really? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's get back onto the, the okay, main so, line. Okay. So the so the WinForms designer. The reason it's it's kind of the pinnacle so far. And in fact, if you look at the WPF designer so far in the developer space, Cider. I'm just waiting for it to get to the same bar set by the WinForms so designer. Tell folks what Cider is. Oh, sorry. Cider is the WPF designer that's inside of Visual Studio. Right. So when you install the, the WPF extensions to Visual yep. Studio or the stuff that'll come with or Orcus. Orcus. Orcus already comes with even a better Cider that comes with. Right. That came so with how many Visual different Studio. XAML editors are there now? There's well, expression, blend, and design. Uh, there's, ex- yes. And then there's also, um, some folks have been building output filters for like Adobe and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, there, thank you. That's a company name, not an application name. Thank you for filling that in for me. Uh, there was the uh, Cider one built into Visual Studio. Sure. Maybe there's a XAML pad or something like that. Oh, well, there's, you know, there's you know, like 27 like XAML pads. But right? what do you write your XAML in? And don't tell me you write it in Notepad. I don't write it in Notepad because I need the IntelliSense. I write it in the uh, XML editor in Visual Studio. Okay. So it's less important that you have a preview for you and more important that you have IntelliSense. Absolutely. Do you, now with HTML, I remember, remember, remember here, so think about this, right? So 92, uh, I, what was the most difficult thing to do? Like what was the pinnacle? It was writing an HTML table without, yes. without yes. looking at the, uh, with the help. Yep. So I that remember. was like, Oh, an HTML is great. It's so intuitive, except I really wish I could write a table. <laughs> so front page existed only for the purposes of allowing people to make really complicated tables with call spans and yep. row spans. Yep, with all the properties in the exactly. property browsers. And in fact, it's funny too because, again, the, what made front page interesting was that it had this kind of WYSIWYG develop, you, you, what you see is what you get um, UI yeah. design environment. So I remember, of course, in Word, the first time they had the table painter. Yes, yes, that yes, blew, yes. That blew my mind. And you could yeah. erase the little lines oh, yeah, between them. Yeah, that was really so a lot of fun. So with XAML, are you anticipating that people are going to just get over it at some point? And when it comes to basic UI stuff, they're going to write them themselves? In, in, with intelligence? No, 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 not, no, not, no, not no. the polylines and stuff, but the regular. No, I don't. Um, I am an oddity in the XAML okay, world. So we in, won't count that. Yeah, in a, in a, well, in many ways, I'm an oddity. But in this particular case... Yes, everyone that I know that's written a XAML book yeah. is able to um, be very productive in the raw. Yeah, so there's three mode. people on the planet who care to do that, but most people use expression or use most, cider. Exactly right. That's okay. exa- exactly what I anticipate. But the beauty of see, this is the huge difference between XAML and the WinForms Designer, and why it is a big step is um, if I go and edit the XAML, I can have a reasonable uh, assurance that the editor, the designers, the visual designers will understand it. Whereas with code, you, as you point out, right, right. it's very likely that they won't. As a short aside, are there, are there buttons and controls in Silverlight? There are buttons. No, there aren't. So you don't get any of those things. No. You want a button, you draw it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, one of the things we talk about in our appendix you do it on is... on purpose. Yes. Yeah, you it on purpose. Th- th- it's all about what is the minimal yeah. environment we can build, we can provide to people to build rich interactive applications. But not full screen, you know, uh, Silverlight application takes over the entire browser. You have two choices, right? And we cover both of these in the appendix because they're both important models. One is you can, you know, uh, mi- use it as little uh, islands of XAML in your HTML and use the regular HTML controls. And, you know, you can have an HTML button for pause and play and rewind for your videos, right? Mm-hmm. The other thing you can do is you can actually, um, of course, you can, from the graphics primitives and the interactive primitives they provide, the event mouse and keyboard event handling, you can build things that look like buttons and work like buttons. And you have the styling in, in XAML and you have the graphics control. And in, um, and in fact, you can even package them in little reusable things that you serve up from your web server. But 
Okay, so like the one thing about HTML that I've always hated is tables, right? Sure. So ta- <laughs> tables as layout has largely been a solved problem because sure. now it's divs and sure. CSS. Yep. But tables as places to put data still exist, right? Of the course. only purpose for a table is for tabular data. Sure. But I have this kind of weird idea in my head that somehow Silverlight is going to replace that. I just want the like the ultimate grid. Sure. In Silverlight, so then I'll have divs for everything. Uh, and then I'll, you know, there's still the hack to figure out how to better lay out forms, but. So what you're saying is that one of two things. One, you look for future versions of Silverlight to have a much richer set of controls built with Silverlight. And I think that's. Well, I wouldn't say that. Just the first guy to write a really awesome grid. Or enterprising <laughs> third parties. Microsoft has, exactly. has made room for enterprising third parties. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, by far and away, the coolest, uh, WPF control that, that I've seen is the uh, the free exceed data grid control. Interestingly enough, and, t- and that's total coincidence, although people won't think so, uh, they were a sponsor of this podcast for a while. Oh, really? <laughs> and they are, uh, if you go into my homepage, enhancement.com, they're the big black uh, advertisement <laughs> under my under my huge head. I, I didn't know that, yeah, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're awesome, those guys are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so anyway. Back so, to the main line again. <laughs> so, okay, so the the visual drawing of things, wizzy wiggy wide. Um uh, one so, of the things, actually, as an aside, one of the really cool things about Chris, as long as I've known him, he has the ability to push things on the stack and pop them off and get right back to where, you know, you never hear Chris go, what was I talking about? He immediately just goes pop, 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 and he's right back where he was. Please. Okay. Well, that's, that's I never amazing, knew that about myself. It's an amazing skill. Well, I, after all that instructor, I think that's what it was, all the the teaching stuff. Right. You right? run you off into to, a, yeah. a tangent, you come back. Yeah. Because you do, the tangents are the fun part. Right. right. See, I've, my, on my on the other hand, I've completely forgotten why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Not an I no clue. That's funny too, because when you do that in regular conversations, if you, I have had to learn to not pop a regular conversation back they freak to people out. Yeah, because they really once they're off in La La Land, that following their rant, yeah. they don't want to be pulled <laughs> they're back. They're done. That's right. They've had that conversation. Now they're moving on. <laughs> yes, this, I've had. To, that's been a problem. They in fact, problem. that thing you point out. So anyway, um, uh, so before ninety two, I would have said that. As an old Unix and Mac programmer, the only thing I liked, the only thing I liked about Windows 3.1 was the programming environment, assuming I could ignore the silly, you know, low, medium, high memory, whatever it was. Um, because not only did I really like the programming model of user 32 when compared to Unix and the Mac for UIs, but th- they had the most amazing thing that changed, transformed my programming life. They had F1. I remember programming without F1 and then finding F1, it was like manna from heaven. Yeah. I mean, that changed my programming life forever. Poor man's intelligence at that point. Well, and then, so in the 92 or after that, that's when, isn't that when we started getting IntelliSense? I mean, yeah, when did we get that? VB3? So I was never, I tried programming Visual Basic several times as a com programmer, right? I had sure, to, sure, yeah. Yep, starting in VB4, VB5, right? right? And I could, I, I could never make it, it now. And I, I, after subsequently, I've learned why. Without the subclassing, I just can't factor my code properly. So that's why I could never be a VB six or below programmer. Right, right. Because of the, the 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 uncomfortable. We're not quite object oriented. We're hiding com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Because the entire purpose. I said this before. The entire point of Visual Basic as a language was to lie to the developer and say, <laughs> you know, make you know, don't look behind the curtain. Com doesn't exist. La la la. I can't hear you. We like to think of it as um, a layer of abstraction. As opposed to lie. I like to think of it as the matrix. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Because what was the first thing you wanted to do when you were a hardcore VB programmer? Call Dan Appleman and get the VBX message cracker uh, <laughs> right. control and see what's really going on. Getting back to the matrix analogy, the value of Visual Basic is it actually show you shows you the blondes, brunettes, and redheads as opposed to making you imagine it the way you have to in C++. Nice matrix reference. Thank you. Thank kudos, you very much. Kudos. So I would say that IntelliSense, and now I am completely spoiled, unless a language or a, a data format or whatever it is I have to type has IntelliSense, yeah. I reject it out of hand. So you're not going to go to Ruby until there's Ruby IntelliSense. Exactly right. And you're not ashamed to say that. No. I with You're coming out. Because a lot of people think that you know programming is supposed to be hard. Squiggly lines underneath my, you know. I it's hard enough to make it work, let alone without, I mean, the the way I learn how to program anything, because there's so much functionality in the world, right? I mean. Um, I think it's Reflector. If I, I didn't have Reflector. But forget about it. Refle- I mean, Reflector is awesome. Oh, yeah, Don't get is. me wrong. And, and I hear I hear somebody in a Microsoft meeting bring up the 
uh, reflector at least once an hour. It just, it is that useful a tool and that prevalent. Um, uh, I was in a review the other day and Don said, I don't want to see the code. Just bring it up in a reflector. He just wanted to see the OM, right? The raw OM. So, so reflector is a big deal, but reflector, there's, I was thinking about this the other day because I've been doing PowerScript a little bit. PowerShell? PowerShell. Thank you. Um, there are so many, there's so much existing functionality on my box. If I had some way to list all of the DLL calls I could make and all of the oh, yeah. dump, XEs yeah. I could call dump with command line arguments thing, yeah. and, and all of the com objects and all of the .NET classes it's and a big surface area. It's a huge surface area. And so if I'm going to navigate that surface area, I want some help. And the help, the thing I do is I go, well, I'm going to, I think, in system dot networking yeah, is something exactly. I want. So I'll right, go right, system right. dot networking dot. Oh wait, here's the thing. Here's, and that's how I learn. This is Lawrence Ryan. Tune in next week for part two of this discussion with guest Chris Sells, right here on Hanselman. Hanselman.